This episode of Tempo Talks was sponsored in part by Fur Planet Productions, publishers of hundreds of anthro titles, including My Six is Wild and Windfall series. Check them out at furplanet.com. Welcome to Culturally Aft, I'm Tempo, and today we'll be talking to Elizabeth Hanna, whose voice you might know as Rosie O'Gravy from Jim Henson's Dog City. Also, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Care Bears, Hello Kitty, Little Bear, Babar, Starlink, Battle for Atlas, and if you're especially Canadian, The Raccoons. This is an interview I've been excited to bring you for a really long time. You may have noticed a slight delay in this episode coming out, which was partially due to other episodes coming out and me writing a novel, and partially due to the file getting corrupted in the final 15 minutes of editing, requiring me to start over. But practice indeed makes perfect, so now it's here and even better than the first go-round. So, without further ado, and before Audacity decides to crash again, let's get started. But anyway, I tried to make them not all dog city questions no i saw that that's great (laughs) um do you want to start out by just introducing who you are for the listeners sure i'm a listener and i am an actor a speech language pathologist and most recently an educator so what are some of the roles that you've played people would be familiar with especially like in shows with talking animals, because... <laughs> in shows with talking animals, are there any other kinds of cartoons? <laughs> Certainly I... that seems to be the most common kind. <laughs> I think it really depends on what age you are, because I've been doing cartoons since the 80s. So going way back, Care Bears, Babar, uh, Beetlejuice, Dog City, Police Academy, more recently, and now we're into the 2000s, Little Bear, um, and uh, most recently, um, things like Corn and Peg and Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. I'm sure I've left out dozens, but I, a bunch. It's okay. They can always look at your IMDb. Sure. <laughs> if they have the time. Um, it's It's fairly long. I am like the only person in the U.S. I know who grew up watching The Raccoons. Yeah, that was cute, and that was very early on in my career, and I think I only did a few episodes, so that's one of the ones I sometimes leave out, but I still get residuals. Awesome. The And The Raccoons, I think, was the first show I ever watched that had, like, a plot from episode to episode. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, I don't know if I ever had seen a cartoon that had that that I really ever paid any attention to before, but you played Nicole, the, the French-Canadian raccoon... Did I? <laughs> I, 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 I? I or like she she sounded French. I assume she was French Canadian since it was a Canadian show. Yes, indeed. I hope I did a reasonable accent that would not offend people from Quebec. <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that people will, you know, let us know. But like, it's I I, I always I, I found it believable from North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different accent, Quebec, from uh, Paris, of course. It's it's very it's very different from the North Dakota accent too. So very would... different indeed. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't think I can do a North Dakota accent nearly as well as you. <laughs> I've had a little practice. You have. Um. So let's see. Um, you 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 were also on uh, Care Bears. Care Bears was also pretty early. I think I did a movie in which I played a kind of a a large Queen of Hearts type character. I. Th- think she was a good queen oh and a very early one but this wasn't animals as i dubbed a japanese version of the wizard of oz but it was great because i got to be glinda i got to be the evil witch and i got to be aunt m i mean how cool is that you always end up playing like witches and queens and people's moms you must just have authority uh, perhaps. It's very interesting. My very first role on stage at the age of eight was as a grandmother in uh, something called Me McGregor's Birthday Party. Mm. And so I was doing a Scottish accent and a grandmother when I was eight years old. And the old <laughs> lady in Babar, mm-hmm. in fact, they had cast an older actress who is roughly the right age. I was in my early 30s and they let her go and replaced her with me. Wow. Which made me feel good, but at the same time, like, really? Do I sound that old? <laughs> voice for a lot of people, especially once people, it, like with trained voice actors, it's really hard for like lay people like me to actually pinpoint how old people are when they're voice acting. Ah, like, that's in interesting. My 
Yeah, like I and I I listen all the time to uh, voiceovers on commercials because that was at one point what I was doing a lot of, and I hear voices that I go, oh yeah, that's a that's a voice in the twenties, that's a voice in the thirties, you know the the I, I pick ages, but you know what I also do? I listen to the voices on computerized assistants. Huh. And um, Google Assistant, for example, has kind of picked a couple of voices that are actually quite young. It's it's very interesting. Hmm. I guess we're just are we just used to having, you know, the young people in our families do all the tech support. So exactly, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> are the computers talking more like us, or are we talking more like computers? Ooh. Took a sci-fi Ooh. turn here. Yeah. Um, so the the Care Bears one, like I I wore out that VHS, the the Care Bears in Wonderland. I I watched that. I have probably watched that hundreds of times because, oh my gosh. like, I I grew up with that one because it came out in eighty seven, I think. And okay, eighty seven, eighty six. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I, I I was born in eighty five, and so like it was readily available. I think we inherited it from my cousins, and. The thing about that show, like, the the most, like, lasting impression, aside from the opening theme, which still plays in my head when someone says Rise and Shine, uh, <laughs> is, is, that one's the most common, <laughs> but the, the most, like, the largest impact for me was the fact that I had already seen Disney's Alice in Wonderland, and then I saw this... And, like, it clicked in my brain that two people could tell the same story differently. Because you played the only reasonable, nice Queen of Hearts in recorded history. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and so... That is so interesting. Yeah, um, like... That, but that's interesting when a child has a story that's familiar and then is able to see that you can tell it a different way. That's a cool lesson. Right, and, and, and like... And now I am a writer because I ended up realizing that stories come from somewhere. Like, cause before that, oh. you know, so like that was, that is like the first, that is literally the first instance. I, I racked my brain and I tried to think of other times that I ever had two versions of a story presented to me. And I distinctly remember being a kid and talking to my like friends and siblings about how it was weird that uh -huh. there wasn't like one queen of hearts there were many ways that you could tell that story and therefore like stories didn't just descend from the stars no. they just they are things. Last... you reminded me now hello kitty was another cartoon i did way back in the 80s and i'm pretty sure hello kitty often retold stories i don't think with the same depth or interest right. but i'm pretty sure they were retelling stories too and some of the humor came from where things got switched about yeah, um, because you were Hello Kitty's mom, and then a bunch of other people. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm rarely an ingenue. I think in some Japanese weird movie, I played two very high voiced little droidy things, but rarely do I get asked to do high voiced things or play children. Hmm. That's okay. Yeah. What cartoons did you watch when you were growing up? Oh, Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny, always, all the way through. There was the, uh, yeah, 5.30 on Saturday afternoons, and that's almost the only cartoons I watched. I mean, <laughs> keep in mind, I'm a lot older than you, so this right. is 50s and 60s. There isn't a whole lot that's there. I mean, later on, I would watch other cartoons, but I frankly always compared them with Bugs Bunny and went, no, doesn't measure up. That no, was your baseline. <laughs> And uh, and things like the the um, the seminal story of the toad, that the silent one where the toad comes out. Hello, my baby. Hello, my. Oh baby. yeah, the dancing yeah, the that, dancing toad. Yeah, over time, I mean that's a very profound story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that one makes a huge impact. impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people. You just have to kind of talk about it, and they go, "Yep." Yeah. But but I remember as a teenager going, "No, this guy called Mel Blank does." all those voices that's astounding <laughs> and how much we have um they they become archetypes that we play off of i think as voice actors sometimes because mm. they're just they were so fabulous mel blanc, blanc played so many voices on looney tunes cartoons that like i lose track even when i know i will lose track because like 
It's the, the exception that he did not play. Yeah. What kinds of like tricks and stuff did you learn from cartoons like that? Like what have you always just run around, you know, doing voices ever since to people like Yeah, I guess. I mean, so so this goes into why I became an actor because yeah. certainly become an actor to do cartoons. I did a very a conventional route. I went to the National Theater School in Montreal, which was at that time run by Douglas Rain, who people may know as the voice of Hal, hmm. the computer on 2001, but at that point was an icon at Stratford, married to Martha Henry, who's doing Prospero this year at Stratford. And they were, um, this is early 70s, and he is um, a little rigid, perhaps, in his thinking. He past us all looking at some billboard that outlined our classes over the next few weeks in the very, very early days that we were there in September and just said, if you learn how to breathe in the next three years, you'll be lucky. <laughs> and and um, I remember him also, we, we, it's just such a contrast because I went back to school in the 90s when you were allowed to complain about teachers <laughs> and you actually gave feedback. But I recall us doing that because some of those teachers at the theater school were of the old school I need to destroy you to build you up oh and we complained about that and he just said you are here to be judged not to judge however uh, um, I I've always done dress up I've always played and I didn't get into voice acting until I had kids really hmm. because um, it allowed theater doesn't pay mm -hmm. and you have to go out of town in Canada mm -hmm. and I had two small children and at that point a husband who was going out of town doing theater so I had to make a living and I did this by doing commercials a lot of voiceovers for commercials and narrations and I just went I know I can do cartoons I know <laughs> I can do this and I did about eight or nine auditions before I began to clip and Babar and Care Bears were, were pretty early on in there. But once I got it, there was a, a period of time in the 80s, 90s where it was just lovely. I went from one to the other to the other to the other. Okay, so to rewind, like, have your kids ever spotted your voice acting? Uh, no, because they, they've always known. Oh, okay. But, but I do recall, because my daughter was born in 87, mm -hmm. and I... I remember she's about maybe two years old and Babar comes on TV and I point to the old lady and I go, that's me, that's me. And she just looked at me and pointed at another character and went, that's me. <laughs> she just kind of, okay, you want to be a character on a TV? I'll be a character on a TV. She was totally <laughs> nonplussed. Um, my kids, and my daughter is an actor herself. And is a brilliant comic storyteller, much better at telling a joke than I am, and very, very good with accents. Uh, my son is an artist, but no, they, they never, they never heard. Oh, actually, it's not a cartoon, mm -hmm. but this, uh, but more recently, sometimes I do, I, I still do narrations, and one of the things this. You won't necessarily want to include this, but <laughs> in CBC documentaries, mm -hmm. so you've got this documentary about the Sochi Olympics in Russia, Okay. and you have all these people talking in Russian, and you want to have them be translated, and you want to hear a narrator's voice, but a, they want to hear an actor kind of, sort of, having the same emotion, which a translator wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So they would hire actors to read the text in English in a Russian accent. And I tell you, my accent in Russian is very Italian, Boris. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> but my daughter is watching this, and this is in the last few years. I mean, she's watching this documentary. It's called The Passionate Eye. And she's going, my mother is just talking in a weird Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? So that, that, that is a kind of a story like that. And, and the whole idea of, kind of being a translator but actually capturing like you weren't so, if they were crying you shouldn't cry but you needed to have some of the emotion do you know what i mean it was it was quite bizarre i've done that a few times i, I would say that counts um it reminds me of when i've when i've had to work with translation teams to translate fiction 
uh, there's a it's it's me and then a native speaker of that language, and like I have to no matter which direction we're going, like there is creativity involved and there's like reinterpretation and like you have to use your own charisma within that language to convey totally. what yeah this would totally. be that's so true and so that that's great I I love it um when you are voicing animal characters do you like get in the headspace somehow you know do you, it's, do you... it's interesting i looked at that question and i realized that sometimes i can't even remember if they were an animal or not mm. because i don't think of the animal mm-hmm. primarily i think of the character mm. now the, this gets into what do the animals do for us because they can be a shorthand right right um, and I think that's true, but I think that uh, there, there's some that would stay with me. But, for example, I was thinking about um, some of the characters I played on Police Academy, and I, I, it almost goes the other way that you go, I'm, an, I'm a human being, but I'm going to think of myself as a cat hmm. or a snake. But you, you always, or at least I have always, gone with the character and gone, what's the size, what's the motivation, and, and really... Similar to the way you do stage acting, only lighter, larger, and more fun. Hmm. Okay. How do you speak differently on stage when you're acting versus in a booth? Ah, well, you have to project on stage, although someone like Martha Henry would say, if you've got the connection between the head, the heart, and the voice, you can whisper and they'll hear you. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the, the projection on stage, and in some ways, because you've got a mic you're playing with, you can be smaller as a cartoon character hmm. because tiny nuances will be there. The bigger difference, though, is on stage, we work through everything chronologically and you go from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. And here you're doing three or four takes of six or seven lines at a time, right? And right. going back on them and going back on them. So, I mean, they're, they're natural nuances that change. Okay. But so you good. Go ahead. I was going to say doing cartoons is does remind me of dressing up as a child without having to have the costumes. But I can be as big and as large as I want. People will often say, Oh, but we don't want you to be too quote unquote cartoony and I I take that as meaning, well, you want me to be real within the cartoon, right? And you have to be real within the cartoon. I take that as kind of a given. Mm. But you, you would think of Mel Blanc. He was he was large, but he was real. Those are all very. We love those characters because Foghorn Leghorn. He's huge, but he's real. Mm-hmm. He's a type. And and they and their emotions are really huge too. Like yeah. you know, Daffy flipping out about something, or Bugs flipping, or, or Bugs having a moment of flipping out. Whatever. Like their emotional range is really really broad compared to what we have in a day. And, yes, indeed. And so, like, but that's, like you said, like, that's, like, a rule within that world. Yes. Yeah. What makes particular roles fun? Um, and, 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 yes, I saw this one and the one that comes after it. The most fun experiences have been where we've been able to work as a company. Hmm. And that's only happened a few times. It happened with Beetlejuice, the fellow who did Police Academy who was already, I think, in his 70s or 80s when he directed us, he ensured we were absolutely there for the whole time, the entire troupe. He would, there were regular characters, but there were always at least a dozen uh, secondary characters that would be cast on the spot, and we always did the entire episode together. Hmm. And we would constantly be breaking ourselves up. The same with Beetlejuice. We were most of the time all together. Little Bear, um, about 50% of the time we'd be together. And it happens less and less. It does. But the other thing that is fantastic, of course, is is, is the surprise or a things you don't expect in a character. In the last 24 hours, a character I've played called Panthea in Mia and Me has come up a lot because I was at a party and someone said, are you in that? I mean, my daughter was listening to it and it sounded like you. And I love that character because she was a classic villainess, mm-hmm. but she was so stupid. <laughs> and she, was, she loved her cat, 
and her and she just wasn't she just wasn't very capable of a lot of things. So, I mean, I just adored that combination of terrifying evil with, with ridiculousness and the fact that she was vain and adored her cat. So, I mean, it's variety. It's, it's, it's what's the unexpected here. Right. Because in very few real life productions, would you be playing like a crazed masked woman who is like stealing unicorn horns no, you're right. But you know what? I mean, I do think that you look for the same thing. Whenever you read an interview with somebody who's playing a villain, like if you read Tom Hardy talking about playing evil characters and various things, mm -hmm. he will, or any good actor, Charlize Theron, or you, they, they will always talk about, I am looking for the other sides here. And it doesn't mean that they want the audience to love them. But I think we are, as human beings... We like to simplify things, yet we are intrigued by complexity, and mm -hmm. we like that. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to unpack that a little bit. So, so basically, we like, we like these broad strokes. Like, we like having really outlandish stuff, but we still seek out, like, the nuance in it. Yes. Yeah. yeah I think, and I think Tom Hardy is often a good example. There's one that's in my brain right now. In Peaky Blinders, I don't know if you know that, but the character he plays is really large and we we see him periodically show a terrifying character but we see him show periodic glimpses of of tenderness and vulnerability and surprise and i think that we're always going to be attracted to that hmm. right because if you're just one note yeah like you can you can be the loudest scariest instrument <laughs> But if you only have yeah. one note, we'll get bored. It's it's not as much fun. It's not as much fun. So so what roles are frustrating? Um, well, I think we've kind of talked yeah. about. Them. <laughs> um, well, they're not. I I'm going to say whenever I've done a cartoon, I have never found it frustrating. Hmm. I never ever ever have, because it is just too much of a license to have fun with a microphone and. Everybody around you, I don't think I've ever been in, in a cartoon where people are just going, eh, just do it, eh, just do it. People care. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel very fortunate. Um, I think it is less fun when... <sighs> What's frustrating is when you've got a voice from New York or a voice from L.A. And they are asking for things via... Skype or something as you're being directed very efficiently by somebody in Toronto where I live and the the voices in the sky are just kind of going well let's have this just to be on the safe side and you can feel them toning you down and mm. blanding you out but partly that's that's just sensing well there's not a dynamic um, when you have a dynamic with somebody on the other side of uh, a a glass in a recording studio, the voice director, I found them, 99% of them are excellent and 1% of them are only good. Mm -hmm. But but that's that dynamic is pretty positive. And I don't know the voices in New York or LA and they clearly are, it, they clearly are, um, perhaps they're more interested in dollar signs. I don't mm. know. Or selling crunchy cereal. <laughs> but that, that, that can make it frustrating. Okay, and um, so let's let's switch over to talking about um, the other sphere that you operate in, or one of them. Uh, yeah. So speech pathology. So like, it's it's fascinating to me this crossover that you do between the two, because like, when I first reached out to you, you said um, like acting is communication, and yeah. that was that was your crossover point, and like what strikes me about this is you know we as people we all feel isolated sometimes like nobody like really really understands us and communication is what breaks down that barrier like it, it pokes holes in that wall and the better we get at it the more we hone our skills at it and understand the tools we're working with the more of ourselves we can like convey through that and that to me feels both a lot both like acting and like learning to speak more clearly and effectively and so like Ooh. i'm really intrigued by this because like i always assumed that as a kid 
when I would watch like cartoons or something and I would hear wacky voices, I'd go, oh, okay, well, they just made a bunch of wacky voices always. And it was just because I never thought about how I spoke. Um, <laughs> And so I just wandered around talking in weird voices. Um, so how did <laughs> so how did you get started in speech pathology? Well, I got started in speech pathology because I was doing wacky voices and I hurt my voice. Actually, it was a stage show, a show called Ten Lost Years that's about the Depression. And it was a long run. You're always in this show. You're always speaking over background noise. Mm. So imagine that you went to a bar and had a conversation at and tried to have a conversation for two and a half hours every night, eight nights a week, uh, eight shows a week. And that at that point I was smoking and drinking alcohol and I got nodules and uh, nodules in my vocal folds and I lost my voice. And I went to a doctor who said, don't talk. And I kind of went, I have to talk. I'm in a show. And I went to actors and voice teachers who, this would be early 80s. I think they're better now, but they were kind of going, oh, you're not really in touch with your chakra. And you know, you're not really in touch with this and that. And, and, and have some, I don't know, rosemary sage tea. And when I went to a speech pathologist, she kind of went, oh, well, what do you have to do? Show me. Oh, okay. What else is going on? Okay, show me. Oh, can I suggest you try that for the time being? And um, here, you, do you know you use more breath to produce less sound than anybody I've ever seen who doesn't have something physiologically wrong with them? It was clear cut. It was related to what I had to do. She gave me a few things that got me through that show that are awfully basic, like, duh, when everybody else is singing, maybe you don't have to sing. Just save your voice for your part. And uh, over time, I I relearned how to use my voice, which um, I had clearly, Douglas Rain was right when he talked about the National Theater School. I had not learned how to breathe, but now I know how to breathe. Took some more voice classes, and uh, I just went, whoa, this is interesting, because there was a side of me that loved acting, but never saw me doing it for the rest of my life. Hmm. Because, you know, women don't have as easy a time of it as men do. You just look at the number of men in any given show and look at the number of women. And I just found myself being attracted to this. So um, it's interesting. This is quick. So there I am in my late 20s and I look into it and find out, oh, my God, I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to do psychology and linguistics and stats and math and then I'm going to have to do a two-year master's full time. I can't possibly do that. And then six years later after I had my kids, nothing had changed. I just looked at it and went, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Relative to having children. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was also just sort of like, I can do that. It's, it's going to be maybe four years. I can do that. And so I did. Hmm. And, and they do connect. I did go into speech pathology, rethinking that I would work only with actors on voice issues. And I'm glad that I discovered a whole lot more that I could do. I ended up working with brain damaged adults uh, due to stroke and head injury for uh, 10 years in rehabilitation. Now I have some voice clients in my private practice, but that's not my focus. Cool. And how similar is it to work with people who are relearning to how to speak th because of traumatic brain injury and actors who are relearning how to speak so they don't hurt themselves? Nah, there, there, really, there really isn't a comparison. Hmm. There really isn't a comparison because um, with, with someone who's had a stroke, you're dealing with a whole family. Yeah. You're dealing with someone who has been knocked off a bridge uh, and their entire life is shifting and you're helping you're you're helping them learn what has happened to them and really helping them crawl back up a cliff and not to minimize what it's like for an actor who has nodules but that's not crawling back up a cliff that's relatively smallish and it's it's interesting that um, I don't mean to minimize it but I that's what's precious about the 10 years I spent with the individuals who had the brain damage, that, that it's, it's working with entire families and entire teams to bring someone back to a life that will, will always be different. 
but uh, to make it as fulfilled as possible and uh, to maintain hope while you adjust to things that are not ever going to be the same. Um, my current practice, I think, pulls a lot. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't use my acting. Mm. I use my acting a lot because uh, um, there is a natural degree of body expressiveness and vocal expressiveness that comes into play when you're dealing with somebody who's lost their language due to a head, head injury. And it was great to model that for family members. And I know that it helped my patients understand what was going on because they would, they would, uh, so if you have aphasia, damage to the left side of your brain in the language areas, you, you get the new, you get the inflections of language, but you may be missing words. Okay. Sure. So an example of the kind of thing I would work with would be aphasia where, uh, Individuals may have a better understanding of intonation, but they're missing the words. They can get the nuance. They can tell if you're angry. They're paying attention. They'll they'll notice that you've left behind your glass of water on the table mm-hmm. better than you would. They're totally with it. But um, so so the the acting abilities I had would really help with that. And just sort of you know the other thing is is allowing yourself to appear foolish. And I think that allowing yourself to appear foolish is valuable in helping others learn how to communicate, whether they have an accent or they have trouble speaking English because they speak another language or whether they have brain damage. But I think one of the things you want to do is help reduce the fear around Mm -hmm. that. And I, I can model being stupid pretty easily. And that helps. Okay, and 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 that makes it when I'm teaching a class, I always try to not worry if I look kind of silly or if I'm jumping up and doing something and showing someone how to do something. Like even though I teach creative writing classes, you know, I'm moving around and exaggerating my voice and doing weird things, and I have had family members see me do this and go, "Isn't that embarrassing?" And I go, <laughs> "I don't know. It probably should be, but." That's some of the most effective ways of teaching that I have had people do for me is I don't care if I look silly. Me being super dignified will not help you absorb this information in part because then you're kind of intimidated by them and you're kind of like they're wise and they know everything and there's no back and forth of information. And now you've pulled into my life as an educator. Yeah. Which has a scholarly side to it. Like I actually read education research and there is literature demonstrating that you can up your student approval ratings by being charismatic by doing the kinds of things you suggest by jumping up and down um and and they although that won't necessarily increase the students marks keep that in mind Mm -hmm. but that's okay they'll like you more and i go yeah it's hard to tell what actually helps people learn but being people you've heard people say educate Entertainment, mm-hmm. the idea of education and entertainment, and and totally. I mean, there, we we know that we learn best when we're engaged, and I think we also create a safe space mm-hmm. for our students, or our listeners, or our patients, or our clients, if we appear silly ourselves because it's permission for them. Right, because then they can be they can, you yeah. know, if we're all looking like fools, then yeah. And I think that 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 circles back to. What were my best experiences when we worked in a group because I could look over and go, oh, my God, he did that so well. He's so funny. And it would um, you could it could inspire me. You could bounce off him. Right. Right. I love watching that on stage when people do that, because you can tell when they are having a good time. You can tell when they are like into it and bouncing off one another and like a little surprised. And those are the best productions I have ever seen or when people are into it. And like, I'll talk to somebody else who is there with me, who's seen it before. And they'll go, it wasn't like that last time. It wasn't exactly like that. The bouncing off. That's, that's just hot. Yeah. It's Mm -hmm. great. Now for people who might want to go into acting or voice acting specifically, is there anything that we should tell people to watch out for about how they use their voice so not to hurt themselves? 
Ah, that's very, very good. Um, I, I will circle back to the difference between breathing. You need to know how to breathe, and you need to know how to relax. Sometimes we're taking a voice that's very extreme. <laughs> we may put a whole lot of extra tension into the area around our throat, and that's what really gets us in trouble. So breathing properly, being relaxed, and then really monitoring yourself and going, oh, ah, I feel a change. If you feel the change and you go, my voice is different now, that hurts. Maybe it does not going to be able to do that kind of voice. Maybe that's just not a voice for you. Um, I, I certainly believe that just like people can have bum knees or, or be prone to laryngitis, people can have a more delicate vocal mechanism. And some people seem to more easily hurt their voices than others. I listen to I listen to some people who coach my dragon boat team and they scream all the time and they seem fine and others seem to lose their voice very quickly. Good voice training is essential for cartoon acting. It reminds me of when I took uh, I actually took singing lessons from a local opera and novelty singer. Uh, yeah. Named Clive Bauman, and he really, really impressed upon me some of the basics like accept your voice for what it is. Do not try to make it into something else, because if you try to force your voice to sound like a specific person on the radio, you will hurt yourself and lessen your ability to do what would be your optimum. You know, he told me you have like a you have like a bare naked ladies kind of voice. That's what you <laughs> should be singing. <laughs> And luckily, I liked, and luckily, I liked Fair Naked Ladies, so it, was, it worked yeah. out. You want to find flexibility in the voice that you have, and you want to stretch that. You know, one other thing that I forgot that's terribly important is when you're in theater, people warm up always. When you're an opera singer, you always warm up. People don't warm up for cartoons, generally. Mm. I warm up now, and it made a difference. It really makes a difference. I don't do a ton, but it's the idea of, yeah, yeah, you know, the, the idea that you skip it for something where you're going to be screaming and coming in with this goofy, strange voice. But on the whole, most of my voices are fairly close to me. I mean, certainly I listen to them and go, oh, yeah, no, that's that's me. And specifically, I remember when I did Hen in Little Bear, they kind of went, no, 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 closer to you, no, closer to you, no, that's you, that's fine. And that's what they wanted. It sounds like if they're picking you, they want you. Yeah, and and it, and it's the idea of flexibility within your range. So I mean, when I listen to Hen, I go, "Yeah, I talk like that sometimes, but that's not my voice because Hen is higher and more anal. But <laughs> it's not a weird voice. It's not a funny voice. And Rosie O'Grady is down here, right? So it's it's um the the but they're but. I can and do speak there. I just don't live there. And the cartoon characters live there in combination with the writer's work. Because that's the other thing. People will say, do such and such a voice and I'll get, give me a script. Mm. Because it's the script that, that is the other half of the equation. And one thing that, that I found really interesting from taking singing lessons was the instructor taught me that if you can make a noise normally in your day... You know, if you can sneeze and make that note, you can train yeah. yourself to make that note on command. Uh, that's a good way to think of it, too. Yes. That, again, ties into zone of comfort and my present life as a speech-language pathologist with my current clients, who I often see for professional communication. And they will come to me with a very generalized goal of being more expressive. And part of it is helping them understand you have a zone of comfort that's considerably smaller than mine. Let's explore and see if we can expand that. That's cool because uh, often they'll go, oh, I can't do that or that's uncomfortable. And it's the two together, helping them gain comfort in this new land. And, and to me, what that did was it gave me hope that I could do that, which I didn't have before. Oh, like, that's cool. That's great. Yeah, like I was just like, that's possible. Oh well, yeah. yeah. If, if you stub your toe and you make that note, well, <laughs> it's accessible to you. Then you can do it. Yeah, because before that, I had a fairly limited 
singing range, but it was totally in my mind. That's cool. And it, yeah, how much of this kind of stuff is in our mind when we think to express ourselves. Singing is great preparation for any kind of speaking vocal work because it really, really gets you to work more um, tremendously on phrasing and breathing. Right. It totally changed how I sing and talk. You know, now I am aware of closing my mouth at the end of notes or, you know, not doing so. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to let this one just trail off and how I'm using my throat and opening up my throat. And so I, you know, yeah, yeah. it's interesting to me how many points in our lives connect to how we talk and listen. Like, how yes. We because we don't even think about it. We're just kind of like, oh, yeah, well, I bumped into somebody at, at the store. Like, I physically bumped into them, and I went, oh! And that weird little noise communicated everything that I needed to say to them, which yeah. was, I am sorry, I have accidentally bumped into you. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't be mad. We do it so automatically that it's fascinating to me that when we start trying to unpack that and say, okay, well, this is what you are physiologically doing, and this is, as a writer... I like to take things apart and see how they work when other people kind of just coast by. And that's, to me, what art is really about. And so, like, to see it used in this way so far outside of my comfort zone is really what's fascinating to me. And indeed, it'll be very interesting over the next decade because we will see so much more of an interface with computerized voices. And... What I'm aware of is people go, Turing test, and that computer voice voice is convincing people, et cetera. And I go, that's partly because we are talking more like computers. Hmm. I think. I think that's, that's a possibility. But I, I certainly listen to the voices that are, uh, and I see progress in terms of what computerized voices are doing. But that, that, that piece of tone of voice and the, oh, and how it can communicate contempt or appreciation. That little vowel, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we, we, it's pretty precious. We got to take care of that. Oh, okay. That's really interesting to me because before today, I would never really thought about people talking more like computers. I had, I'd only really thought about how in my own life, I tend to dial down my North Dakota accent a little bit just to be a little bit more non-dialectical so that people can understand me. And that's something that I picked up when I was, you know, in addition to just like in general in society, people don't, people don't take you very seriously when you're you sound, right. Yeah. When you sound like you're going to offer them a coffee and a bar and we're going <laughs> to have, that doesn't sound quite academic. And so, yeah. And it's less perhaps talking like computers than, communicating like computers mm -hmm. i'm thinking of how uh my phone will discourage me from uh, an inclination to make up a word or to do a funny kind of word and it'll kind of go no 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 no. surely you mean this surely you don't mean that you're you're creating a verb and and i i don't have that in my dictionary and so it, it kind of simplifies certain kinds of things and oh. i'm thinking of um yeah just that we inevitably we're adaptable creatures and if we're interacting a lot with Siri, mm -hmm. we're adjusting how we ask Siri questions. Right, right. I, I have found myself doing that. Back before Siri, Google had a thing. It was Google 411. You would call a specific number and you could say on your non-smartphone, tell me the address of such and such. But it was not so great at deciphering what you were saying. And so you had to talk oh. like a robot and you had to say what it was expecting. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It'll be a very interesting decade. I just think it'll be a very interesting decade. Hmm. Um, also with uh, video games and avatars and, and the voicing of those. You're also an accent coach. I'm an accent coach and very, very careful to say I do not get rid of accents. I help people modify their communication in general, which would include the accents, so they are more effective communicators when we were talking before, like we all kind of do this automatically. I live in North Dakota. So when I'm talking to somebody who's from a small town, who is maybe older or looks a little bit nervous, my accent will start coming back a little bit. Yeah. And I'll say, Oh, Hey, are you lost? Like, whereas normally yeah. like I'd say, Hey, are, are you lost? And that 
signals to them that I am not intimidating. I don't people you don't hear like your money or your life coming out of a dark alley. Yeah. Like yeah. that's <laughs> Yeah, it's not... there, there are so many elements in it. Um, the, I mean, we all have various registers for speaking to people who are 20 years older than us, for speaking to children, for, I always use the example of speaking to the queen, mm. uh, because there, there, there are kinds of things we would do speaking to the queen. We all have, a, we all have within ourselves a few accents. And for individuals who speak other languages and are mentally coping with the stress of, kind of translating, although the people I work with by and large are fluent, but still, it's it's more work. I mean, they speak about going, it's exhausting, it's hard to keep track of. Helping them understand what sounds, they can just say, oh, don't worry about that, that's okay. That That's not gonna get in the way of people understanding you, whereas that one will. Or uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So if somebody has trouble saying TH, mm -hmm. Which is a pretty stupid sound when you think of it, and most <laughs> sensible languages don't have that sound. Think of how it's used in English with this, that, them, they, there, mm -hmm. which are all tiny little function words that you say very fast. And those little function words, if they go dis, dem, dare, it doesn't affect comprehension. They better say think, and they better say thing, and all those ths, but those are more important words, and you have more time to say those. So it's not that I say, oh, don't worry about that, but I don't, I help them understand. Great that you figured out your TH is different, but that's not as important as this sound. Do you follow me? Absolutely. That's really interesting because I, I have long wondered why it doesn't matter when I sometimes say dat instead of that accidentally. No one gets confused. No. But if I, I never say, I dink this. No. It's a, they're function and content word. This isn't so much accents that I work with because there are certain uh, groups that will tend to come to me in Toronto just because they're large immigrant groups. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how like certain animals suggest things, certain accents suggest things, and certain accents also involve kind of facial postures. Like, um, I mean, Irish and Scottish are a good example. It really helps if you smile if you do an Irish accent. Mm. It's got a bit of a lilt to it, you know? Whereas there's something about a Scottish accent that just you feel everything getting a bit tight there in the face. And it's, it's just got a certain, I don't know, squishness in the mouth. And and, and feeling where the centre is, um, it's that's very neat. It's also neat as a speech pathologist to go, what the heck am I doing? And I have a better understanding of what I'm doing than I did when I was an actor. That's really cool because as a layperson, a Scottish accent and an Irish accent, I can tell them apart, but I have trouble making one distinct from the other when I try to use that accent. And of course, any self-respecting Scot or Irishman would at this point say, and there are two dozen accents at least <laughs> in each category. <laughs> Belfast versus Cork versus etc. It's interesting that someone who is immersed in that accent, they know those sub accents and they know the sorts of things like, oh, well, you wouldn't use this word choice if you were yeah. from wherever, you know, you'd say this instead. And I think accents are endlessly fascinating. And as a writer, I find them endlessly frustrating. When you're writing, you can't say, okay, and then he pronounced all his I's this way and oh, all his yeah. E's this it, way. That's it tricky but it's wonderful to get a color of it and you do come across writers who do i can't think of any one at the moment but it's you you do we've, we've come across writers who manage to do it it's the kind of thing you have to it's a gamble because mm -hmm. we have to accept that the words are going to be spelt differently on the page right like mark twain's stuff you can yeah. t you totally you can to it's like phonetic you know exactly what they sound like it is not a hundred percent easy to parse <laughs> sometimes yeah. but it totally you know sounds like doing, and the successful people are doing it by doing the vowels because it's the consonants don't shift around as much as the vowels in my first book six is wild i have the main character since she has a southern accent never says i she says i and so therefore yeah. it's a h every single time in yeah. the entire book uh, yeah and, and that one little signifier 
kind of like the reverse of what you talked about, where like there are places you can cut corners and not worry about pronunciation as closely and people won't know. If you use these, those are, you know, a bright blinking light of this person has a southern accent. Yeah, no, and it's it you know it it actually comes to the same thing because we're we we can excuse the D for T H error because our brains don't need that sound, and we quickly interpret the A uh for I because we go oh well, that's got to be southern, cool. Yeah. Now, directly before this, you were out on a dragon boat, which is like rowing <laughs> for more sociable people, I guess people who have more Except, friends. Uh, and I'm paddling. Okay. You go forward. Rowing, you go backward. Oh. And and we dragon boat paddlers get we, we, we get very tired of explaining this to people. So you paddle with one paddle mm -hmm. and you row with two. Oh. So in a dragon boat you paddle with twenty people in the boat and a steers person and when you do it competitively you have a drummer. But you don't have a drummer most of the time because the drummer doesn't really do anything except yell at you. They don't actually <laughs> tell you to, they don't actually tell you to stroke, 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 because if you need to be told to stroke, 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 you're going to be off. Um, yes, I compete um, internationally with a group of women all over the age of 60, and we are going to Hungary quite shortly in July to compete at the Club Crew Championship, the World Championship. Wow. Yeah, uh, it is cool. Every time I talk to you, I find out another crazy thing that you have done or are doing for someone who is younger than my parents you've just done all kinds of things like before meeting you i thought that rosie o'gravy was comically over accomplished as like a mary sue and then i met you and now i'm like oh okay that's just how elizabeth is oh no i'm <laughs> sorry yeah that and also that i've taken not right-hand turns, but three fairly significant turns in my life that have been exceedingly fortunate, from acting to speech pathology to education, and then within acting to voice work, and within speech pathology towards what I do now from what I did before. But I mean, they're, they're very lucky right-hand turns. The number of crazy projects that you have been involved in, and I am on board with that completely because... When I talk to people about the things I have ended up doing, whether it's writing books or going on tour to different countries. I was in Brazil a while ago. I was in Toronto a while ago. When I explain that, oh yeah, I worked on video games and I've organized political protests when Trump came. I was the guy with the Ludafisk sign. <laughs> Thank you for being the guy with the Ludafisk sign. <laughs> Thank you for protesting, Trump. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think that we are fortunate, you and I, that we um, we have identified passions mm -hmm. that we've managed to uh, turn into making a living with. And to me, the thing that I wish I had known going in is that making it isn't like a sudden break. Making no. it is a gradient <laughs> of yes, accomplishment. Honestly, and a road that's always shifting and going, okay, what's down this road? Oh, look at that. And it, it usually works out. Right. And, and you just have to keep trying new stuff and like putting yourself out there and learning and as much as you can about all these things that are, you know, you, you may not even feel like they're involved, but then it turns out it'll enrich your ability to do the thing you love. And I also count myself really fortunate that I have been able to kind of cobble together a living from all of these weird, disparate things. So just to give people kind of an intro, you played Rosie O'Gravy, Dog City's Top Cop. Mm. The show came out when I was nine. <laughs> so between Nelvana Animation and, and Muppets, I was completely hooked. It made such a huge impression on me that as soon as Six is Wild, my first book came out, I emailed you, like, this gushing thank you for voicing Rosie O'Gravy and inspiring me to write about talking animals and feminism, and you were very nice. I was very nice, but I didn't really get how excited you were, or, in fact, I think as I did the character, mm -hmm. I don't think I appreciated what an opportunity it was. Mm-hmm. Does that happen a lot with voice acting? Like, you don't really process it till later, or...? 
Yeah, no, exactly. Because, I mean, I run into people who see things I did 30 years ago and tell me how they responded to it. That was, you were nine years old. How many years ago was that? Um, I'm 33 right now. There so, you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I certainly went, oh, I do want to play this gorgeous Irish setter. And isn't it cool that she's the chief of police? And I just enjoyed saying her name. Mm hmm. Rosie O'Gravy. It's just so funny. Right. Everything in the show is just a weird pun like that. Yeah. So for the people who haven't seen the show, in detective fiction, there are two tropes that come into play here. One is the relentless lone wolf gumshoe who's at loggerheads with the chief of police who's by the book. Yes. And then there's the femme fatale who's powerful and dangerous. And Rosie was just both of those at once. And exactly. So was, there was great economy of writing there. Yes. Years later in college, I took noir fiction, and I was like, cool, I'm sure there will be other examples of this. And my, my professor was just like, no, that's, that's really atypical. I wrote my essay on this for that class. Wow. I mean, I think it, and this obviously was an inspiration. Mm -hmm. Lorraine Bacall could do that. Lorraine Bacall, I think, for many in my generation, epitomized somebody who was... I am dangerous, I am sexy, but I am in control. Hmm. I have a degree of, of, uh, of almost a lack of vulnerability, a sort of mystery that, that just puts her um, ahead of a great many of the dangerous femme fatale types. So the danger is quite real, but not scary, vulnerable, I, I'm going to have to take care of this person danger. Right, and she's from that Humphrey Bogart era. Yeah. Of of cinema, like the golden age. Yeah. Was that like one of the main influences for the, how you voiced oh, yeah. this character? Yeah, I mean, I think most actors will say, I never try to do another character. Mm -hmm. I never try to do Lorem Bacall or anything like that. But I think we, we naturally, inevitably are inspired by some of these types. And they get blended in with our own personality and choices. And certainly the idea of, being in control, being slightly world weary with Ace Heart, but still having a kind of a uh, sighing attraction for him. But actually, I saw that as a very small element. Hmm. Most of it was no. I, I was he was a bit of a, a young boy for me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, well, and and like in the show, the show's written like that too. Like he he is yeah. the the alter ego of this kind of innocent doofus animator yeah. guy and so you oh, know that was sweet the live action stuff wasn't it yeah and like I, jim henson stuff's <laughs> always amazing to me yeah uh so how'd you get involved in the series um that was shortly after beetlejuice and i think i was on a bit of a roll it's interesting because I certainly didn't do any of those kinds of voices in Beetlejuice, mm -hmm. but we all got to play a few secondary characters on Beetlejuice, and I probably did voice um, a nice throaty-voiced character or something like that. And I auditioned, and I got it, but I remember it being a fairly painless process. I remember for Beetlejuice, I had to do about six auditions, and for this, it was, yep, mm-hmm, okay, there you are. So is that normal for voice work, to do a whole bunch of auditions? Yes, it is. Uh, well, it's normal to do two or three. So to do just one, and I, I did just one for this, as I recall. I did just one for um, Little Bear. And obviously, when you're doing a character that's only in three or four episodes, you only do one audition. Okay. So what did you think of Rosie O'Gravy as a character? Like, how did, how did she stack up to other characters you'd played? Well, although I hadn't delved into where she stood in feminist history, as you have. I, I, knew I, loved her. I knew I loved her. I kind of went, look at her. She's gorgeous. And mm -hmm. she's on top of things. I, I see myself as a feminist in the sense of, well, duh, of course, because I just see it as an equal opportunity thing, the same way I kept my own last name throughout my life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea that she would be, and perhaps that's why I didn't examine it, that mm -hmm. I just go, yeah, chief of police. Why not? Of course. Right. It was natural. Yeah. Since the ultimate goal of feminism is for us not to really even worry about it anymore. Exactly. But there was there were it was delightful to be the one that is 
pulling Ace, uh, Ace Hart out of scrapes, that mm -hmm. is coming in and tidying things up afterwards. I mean, they, they, there are, when I look back on it, a lot of switches that I enjoyed but did not appreciate at the time. Mm -hmm. Right, just flips on the normal script. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, you're the same age as my kids, well, you're a little older, mm -hmm. but it's also their favorite series. Oh, good. So yeah, yeah, no, and I've, I've kind of asked them a couple of questions since, um, you know, going to, did you realize that when I did Rosie O'Grady, she was this and this and that, and they kind of went, well, uh, yeah, now that you mention it, but <laughs> not at the time. That's great. I feel validated that your kids also like the show. <laughs> oh, no, I come across people that go dog city because, well, it, it didn't run very long and it was pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. And so the people who like Dog City, I immediately glom onto. It's delightful. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if we can drag you to a furry convention, I'm sure that my other people will come up and appreciate it. Like, we'll put you on a panel or something. <laughs> That'd be fun. Okay, so Rosie is simultaneously the most compassionate character on the show most of the time and the most analytical character on the show. And those are traits we don't see a lot of together. We don't see a lot of those for the same in the same character. And why do you think we don't get a lot of that? Is it just because there are so many male characters and we don't think of... Yeah. I think it is, it is a tribute to the writers and the people who came up with the concept and tried to fulfill it that they... they and perhaps this is why I hadn't analyzed it because they go, so what is so weird about being analytical and compassionate at the same time? Mm -hmm. Is this not motherhood generally? <laughs> and, um, and, but, 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 but isn't it interesting that this is a show that only lasted a, a short period of time? Perhaps it just broke too many boundaries and was a little too unconventional. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so in terms of why, I think that we it broke stereotypes and it's hard for us to break stereotypes Always. You mm -hmm. do it little by little. You retreat, you go back. You, little by little, you retreat, you go back, you go forward. Mm -hmm. Because we see a lot of characters who are like, oh, I don't know, like House on House MD. They are super smart and they can therefore be a jerk. And those are like, Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And when you were say, asking the question, I was going, compassionate and analytical is something we don't tend to put together in either male or female characters. Mm, true. Now, was she a little too perfect, though? That, I mean, where were her failings? And that, that would be, I remember talking to you earlier about my favorite characters. Mm -hmm. And although I adored Rosie O'Gravy, Rosie doesn't have a lot of failings. It's cool what she combines, mm -hmm. because she is unusual in that respect. But I think the most brilliant characters are those that, that have flaws and uh, deficits that you can see and identify with. Mm-hmm. I rewatched some of the show because I hadn't seen it in a couple of years to get ready for the interview. And the only real flaws I can think of are things like doesn't really seem to have a lot of close friendships. <laughs> no, probably not. You know? She's very, devoted, very devoted to her work is Rosie. Right. You know, like doesn't seem to have a lot of like close relationships. I think we see her dad like once or twice. Yeah, that's right. And and then beyond that, that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, trying to be too perfect, I guess. You know, that could... Yeah. It has its price. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we say knowingly, oh, it's difficult for us to be so, so perfect. <laughs> that's a really interesting point, because it's difficult to write characters who break the mold, who, like, show that you can be all sorts of things without actually making them a mary sue yes yeah because because but here and there the occasional slip up it's it's having everybody arc and mm -hmm. change right it's and cool. i think if we had gotten more than 31 or yeah, two you would. episodes we would have gotten that absolutely because those writers were so bright and so much fun right i enjoy showing people that cartoon for the dog jokes alone because everything <laughs> is just layered in like detective noir puns and dog yeah. puns constantly yeah. now you talked about being compassionate and yet analytical is kind of you know inherent in motherhood rosie is interesting partly because of who she isn't she isn't somebody's mom which you know you she voiced somebody's mom a lot 
<laughs> and she isn't but, like. But don't you think she's a little motherly towards mm-hmm. Ace, and that's what keeps them apart to some extent? Right, they're not equals mm-hmm. if she's constantly coming in and saying, "I will not let you do X, Y, and Z." Yeah, no, there's a. I mean, she's not motherly in a conventional way, but but there's a bit of that note in the relationship. And that's Mm -hmm. what kind of keeps them at a distance, I think. And I think that's true in interactions between women and men generally. Sometimes there are these guys who don't have a ton of female friends, maybe, and are mostly used to interacting with gals who are like their mom or their boss or their teachers or whoever. And they're like, okay, cool, I kind of have to answer to you and you'll kind of keep me in line. And I think that that limited perspective is probably why Elliot doesn't have a girlfriend. (laughs) That is very, that's a great observation and a very honest one. Thank you. (laughs) We won't say what percentage of men are like this. Right. And the thing is that that whatever percentage it is, we we do go in and out of these in terms of my only relationships or some of my relationships. That's very interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah. And so when I look at Elliot, that's what I kind of think. I'm like, you're a good guy, but you just don't have the script for this. Like you don't, you haven't read the the script on how to do this. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, so she isn't the mom per se. Like she's not someone's literal mom. She's not like the, she's not the team girl. And she doesn't, no. she's not like the damsel. She doesn't constantly need to be rescued more than anybody else. And she isn't really one of the guys. Like, she's not ever really shown hanging out with or even the other cops in the show. And so oh, those are all kind of cliches when you're writing a female character. What are the cliches that you find most frustrating in television and cartoons in particular? Oh, uh, well, I think you've, you've listed them, but the... Uh... A girl that doesn't think, a woman that doesn't think, a woman that needs to be rescued, uh, a woman that that, uh, plays along conventional lines. I like to think mothers are fine, Mm -hmm. but it's when mothers can have strength. And I've mentioned before that, that I think what makes all characters come alive, male or female, is surprise and complexity. Mm -hmm. And even in cartoons, we can find that. And even as we talk about... um, Rosie's being kind of perfect. We we picked on some loner qualities that she's got that, as you mentioned, in a second or third season that might have been explored. Right. And I find that cliches aren't themselves bad. Like, cliches no. aren't, aren't inherently bad. And so having somebody who acts like that, we're not saying that nobody can ever do that. But I find that by putting those specific tools aside and saying, I'm going to have to do something different, it makes you be more creative, which is what you're trying to do in a creative (laughs) endeavor anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly what Dog City is doing, is playing with cliches. And they're kind of like the walls that are padded, and then periodically, because it's Dog City and it breaks some of those cliches, you you just punch through and find new stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the show was my first real exposure to what, detective noir fiction was supposed to look like it has i'm sure distorted my idea of what detective noir is supposed to be because i learned it backwards like i think you're supposed to I, yeah i'm just realizing that so you saw dog city before you saw humphrey bogart movies right <laughs> and, and so I, I read them and i'm like boy these are really dour you know i read books like that and watch movies like that i'm like wow these are these kind of kind of grim i'm waiting for it to be wacky well there's a wackiness to it the maltese falcon and the back and forth at the end and, right Right. There's all kind of, there's wackiness. And, and especially if you read, I mean, read Mary Astor's biography. She was one interesting woman. Hmm. Mary Astor was... Oh, yeah. um, Mary Astor was the dame in the Maltese Falcon. Mm-hmm. And she had a seriously hot affair, which she diarized and was, and ended up in court and basically ended her career. But it was pretty hot stuff at the time. <laughs> Seriously, look her up. It's it's pretty. Cool. We are giving people reading material all the time <laughs> on this. Uh, I, now that was also the first time I'd ever seen a show where a character actually got written off and insulted repeatedly for her gender. Like I had been watching Magic School Bus and things before that. Most cartoons, you know, they kind of dance around the topic of sexism. Yeah. And like a lot of kids shows, just pretend it doesn't exist, or you know, at best, or they get lazy and just 
write lazy sexism into their show. What do you think are the advantages of children's programming dealing with topics like that head on? Oh, what a great question. Um, I, I think it's, it's so important that we, children's programming needs to grapple with those is issues head on to give small children, even small children, a diversity of ideas that they can begin to contend with. Kids are desperately looking for structure and kind of like, oh, okay, how does the world work? How does the world work? But we underestimate their ability to take the confusion. By, by even by four or five, they need to begin grappling with the fact that it isn't always anything. Nothing is always any one thing. Mm. And so I think that beginning to grapple with the, the complexity and a gender issue is part of that. Right. There, there are exceptions to any rule. You can't just put people in yeah. boxes. You don't have kids yourself, right? Nope. Okay. So standard sexual identity, and, and I can be corrected around this, they, they desperately look to identify around the age of three. Mm -hmm. And you know that in Toys R Us, we have blue aisles and pink aisles now. It's worse than it was in the 70s. And so you have little girls who decide that they need to be little girls going dress in tights, dress in tights. And, you know, it's just so limiting. And and to have something, to have as many images that allow them to go, yep, I can be that. Yep, I can be that. Yes, that's part of my female identity. It just helps them go out of dress and tights and try something else. I think it was Target a couple of years back got rid of the pink and blue aisles. Oh, gotta, gotta. There are other colors. I think I dress my children so much in browns and yellows and greens and there were they looked similar they're a mm -hmm. boy and a girl and in fact my brother ended up putting a picture of my daughter and labeling it as my son because <laughs> they were both wearing uh, leather jackets right looking butch children's programming is almost parenting by proxy you're saying things like here kids you know you can both do this it's fine um yeah. the my little pony Friendship is Magic show that came out a few years ago was huge in part with guys and with gals because it said, well, you can be either. Like, you know, you can like dressing up and tea parties and baking and whatever, or you can like adventure and rough and tumble things and whatever. And that's fine. And you can easily switch off between the two. Like, we are not so limited. Right. And, and you just. Oh, sorry. You just made me think of something about Dog City in mm -hmm. comparison with uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is a show I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood is a lovely show meant for younger kids and explicitly takes those kinds of things and almost sends them out as messages. Hmm. What's cool about Dog City is it doesn't send it out as a message. It's just there. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. It's lived. And in Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, perhaps... For my adult taste, I am less enthused about it because it's explicit. And I, I like to discover things for myself as opposed to, uh, you know, it's a bit on the nose. Do you know that phrase? Right. On the nose. When something's on the nose, it's just a bit too much. Now, it is a great show and it's sweet. Uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and I do hope to continue voicing the character of the platypus. So I'm not saying anything bad about it. <laughs> but the, the fun about Dog City is that it's just there. It's not Rosie O'Grady saying, hey, isn't it cool that I'm in this role? She just is. Right. She doesn't have to turn to the camera and say no. the fact that it's for a three-year-old audience instead of, you they know. Need, they need a little bit more explicitness, of course. I don't know they if I told you last time, but after our initial setup call, I was talking to my sister and my dad. They were like, so, so what's it like being 33? Oh, well, it's a lot like being three. I spent a lot of time talking to cartoon <laughs> characters. <laughs> We've got to wrap up, Tempe. Sure, sure. So the last couple are, as a love interest on the show, she's not just won over. Like, Ace has to actually consistently prove himself to even get any kind of attention from her, or she will immediately tell him that she is displeased. What kinds of lessons do you wish we saw more of? Because that's valuable. Like, what kinds of lessons do you wish we saw more of in programming for young people about relationships? Oh, yeah, no, you ask wonderful questions, and I will confess, I often go, I really haven't thought of that. <laughs> that's okay. You are not the first person to say that. No, 
And b- partly also because I, I tended to jump immediately to characters that were not love interest. Mm-hmm. I don't think I'd, I'm trying to think if I've, I think Rosie O'Grady might be the closest I've played to love interest. Mm-hmm. And she isn't conventional love interest, but I tend to be mothers or sidekicks or grandmothers or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, you, what you want is back and forth. What you want is actual conversation in simpatico as opposed to love at first sight. Mm. What you want is is challenge in a relationship, that there are ups and downs. Um, I think sometimes in cartoons we have great buddy relationships, and it's not that a love relationship is a buddy relationship, but you can benefit by having having a bit more of that in what is conven- conventionally shown in love relationships so that there is a bit more of backwards and forwards and I need some time on my own and um, boy it's really good to do this kind of everyday thing with you it doesn't always have to be super intense right Does that help yeah, yeah yeah it helps to actually be friends yes of course the flip side of that would be I was watching the show and when I was like nine and it wasn't the only show on TV that had divorced parents. That was like the theme of an entire episode. Yeah. And a few years after the show went off the air, my parents' marriage kind of fell apart. And it was really reassuring to have shows like that have given me that support that I didn't really think about at the time. But like you said, kids are constantly just soaking up rules for how the world works. Yeah. And just like how being from a divorced home didn't really hold rosie o'gravy back i didn't really think about it at the time at all but shows like that showing that really made it easy for me to say when when people would say to me oh well isn't it hard for you to not have your mom around and i'd say like well no i mean why would that hold me back from doing stuff like it it's not fun but it you know it doesn't really hold me back from anything yeah i mean it's life and so that was just sort of my part of my foundation I'm going to say I don't think cartoons do this enough. And Mm -hmm. and I think there are a thousand ways in which, and I think it's again that continuum of you can present diversity Mm -hmm. uh, as might have been done in Dog City, or you can be explicit about it. I'm thinking again of Daniel Tiger and how there are uh, moms who work and there are diverse parenting-ish structures that... But I don't think anybody's divorced exactly. That's just a maybe a bit too dark. And you go, but it isn't. It isn't. I think that we have an opportunity with uh, gay families. We have so many family configurations that I think it'd be that we can make use of now that children may need to be reassured mm-hmm. that, yeah, okay. It's okay to have two moms time. or it's okay to have whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and I completely agree. I think it's really important to have this as sort of the foundation for kids because that's why I keep coming back to the well on cartoons and things is because nobody has a perfect upbringing. Nobody has perfect parents. But in a way, art intended for kids can kind of shore up some of those cracks that might form. And you can Mm -hmm. say, well, for me, it was Dog City, but for someone else, it could be Winnie the Pooh or whatever. And they're like, you know, oh, well... Kanga is a single mom. (laughs) Apparently, I don't know if we ever see Rue's dad. But yeah, you know. You're right. You're right. It is one of those things where people kind of write it off as lightweight and silly, but it is one of the things that has a deep impact on our society. Absolutely. So to wrap up, how much do you know of the furry fandom? Have you had run-ins with fans who are going to conventions too or anything? Or is it mostly just me? Never. Never, never, never. (laughs) I got some fan mail from two girls in the U.S. about a character or two I did in Sailor Moon years ago. And they sent me American stamps so I could send back their their signed something or other. And I kind of went, no, the American stamps won't work. I'll have to buy Canadian stamps. Um, but that's about it. No, tell me about the free fandom. It is an umbrella fandom of other franchises. So like pretty much anything that has talking animals in it, it's kind of a conglomeration of those fandoms. And so like if you like the new My Little Pony, or if you like Dog City, or if you like, you know, things like that, anything there that's... There are so many, aren't there? Right. There's, you know, tons of them. And so if you like Disney movies, and you are like a teen or adult, 
there's this fandom that you engage in and because there's so much crossover in what you like if you like pete's dragon or whatever i don't know i was trying to think of something old if you like dog city you probably also like balto or something and so Ooh. Okay. yeah <laughs> See, so you're basically in the fandom because that was pretty much the only qualification is that you like talking animal movies but um and then like there are conventions and whatever i'm, I'm actually going to one on this weekend I'm, i will be at anthrocon which has i think about ten thousand people at it holy cow and then uh mff has about ten thousand people too and that one's in november people dress up in costumes at they dress up either as characters from shows or dress up as characters they've made up and things like that comic-con kind of atmosphere yeah yeah now, that's it, what i imagined it to be like but but it does boggle my mind uh, but but it's so great that the internet allows it allows everybody to find each other and do these cool things. Absolutely. Like, looking at the history of the furry fandom, it wasn't possible to have this kind of organization between people who weren't connected before. Like, you know, you could have Star Trek conventions because Star Trek was on TV and everybody kind of knew about it, and therefore you could get on a mailing list or something. But, like, prior to email and prior to you know even rudimentary websites there just wasn't a way and so about yeah. like the late 90s early 2000s is when this started to pick up and people would instead of just having the fandom disperse after one show when star trek's off the air the fandom kind of slowly goes dormant whereas with the furry fandom it is constantly not only like finding new shows to be excited about but it's also self-sustaining and making its own stuff for people cool. to be excited about and so like my books since they have talking animal people in them i am something like the second most popular novelist in the furry fandom because i have written a, my fourth book is coming out they're just taking those same tropes of here are some talking animal people and we're going to use them so that you don't have to have the real world baggage of this being like a human and then <laughs> <laughs> which is really the only shortcut that's the, that's why we do it and so you know it lets you have that one step back from reality and then yes. you can do anything but yeah if you ever if you ever want to hit up a furry convention i i will totally make sure i'm there and th you've been in enough things that they would probably make you guest of honor they made me guest of honor at a couple of them i was at i was guest of honor at one in toronto a couple of years ago and well. so let's start with something close to hand but are, are you talking about like they would pay my way to get there yeah that's usually what they do for guests of honor oh, that's that would be delightful i'd be very interested in finding out about anything where you would be at so i could at least have one person that i had spoken to <laughs> outside of a costume <laughs> right exactly <laughs> when you look at pictures of furry conventions here uh they tend to have like oh here's one from uh nbc they have people in costumes and they have people with all sorts of like crazy outfits and things but like most people who go are just okay. there to be excited and they're in normal clothes and yeah i'll, I'll... So keep, me, keep me in touch keep absolutely. me in touch with it i would uh, and if i find it with dragon boating or something else and all the more fun absolutely i will try to find ones either local or somewhere that correspond to your globe tracking Oh, no. If there is a possibility of expenses being paid, I'm interested. Okay. Of course. It's a cool way to see different things in the world. Well, and, and voice actors seem to get very little rock star attention compared to... We don't to... get out much. We're in <laughs> studios all the time. We don't meet other people. Right. Well, and you, I'm sure that you have met hundreds of people who have been fans of something you have done, but they didn't know you on site. <laughs> No, no, that it's it's sort of chatting to them and going, oh, you did cartoons, and you start listing them, and they go, and they pay no attention until you hit the one they watched as a child, mm -hmm. and they go, you did this, and they just, it's quite, quite fun to kind of go, figure out the age of either them or their own children, and then you you are suddenly elevated in their eyes. It's it's very sweet and it's wonderful and it's such a gift in my life. Yeah, it, it's it's really amazing the impact this has. I am an adult. I write books for grown-ups. I, I don't have kids. And yet, when I have gone back and watched this or I've been talking to you about it, I will have little moments where I'm nine years old again. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is powerful. so cool. Yeah. Powerful. All right. 
so I have to go. Uh, yeah, that was the end of that's the end of our questions. We don't have to do a part <laughs> three. <laughs> right, that's fine. But do do stay in touch, and if you want me to listen to something or you have any questions, I trust you not to hmm. not to alter things so I sound like I defend Trump or something. Oh no, um, heavens no! Like I've gotten a tiny hint of that. You know your like activism stuff. I think you did some sort of safe feeding thing in multiple languages. Oh God. Uh, that's hardly activism. That's that's uh, associated with, but I, I feel pretty strongly about multicultural issues. Mm-hmm. And Toronto is a city that is full of people that don't speak English. Oh yeah. And we pretend we know how we we ignore them in healthcare. We we step over the challenges of dealing with them. And it so happened I worked at a hospital that had a substantial Chinese population. So I, I made this video in Cantonese and Mandarin, neither of which are languages I speak. Um, and uh, but it's just a teeny little video about how to feed people because right. it's actually more complicated than one would think. And the thing that I liked about that was, to me, that is activism. Activism isn't just when I go out and I hold a sign to protest Trump or I go on TV and talk about how Trump's terrible. It's every little thing that someone does to better the world, to say, I'm going out of my way, I'm putting in work to do this, to make a change in a way that i believe is right every raindrop raises the sea so Indeed. you know so if we can all do that i think that helps a lot anyway but we could go on and on but i know you have to get going yeah so. we could. <laughs> but, but it, it does let me say that this has been a delightful reacquaintance i mean you you sent me your book a while ago and i went oh isn't that nice how lovely and he's so grateful that i just Bonded. Isn't that nice? Because it just struck me as politeness. Mm-hmm. But I've really enjoyed talking to you, and it's it's a you've allowed me to indulge in things. But it's also you're you're clearly an intelligent guy that's dug into some really interesting stuff that I haven't thought about. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, I can't think of a higher compliment. So it's been just really amazing. It inspires me to always be kind and benevolent toward people in general because we are far more interconnected in life than we think and so it's i have benefited even from that little like interaction in like i think it was 2011 i sent you like an email Uh and said hey and even that like made me say okay well that's i should totally approach fans who write me letters like that like i should say oh yeah yeah thank you you know like take the time and whatever and i appreciate a lot that someone who put in a bunch of work to make me not a jerk when I was nine <laughs> has has come back around to help do that you know a couple more times and so that's that's absolutely wonderful and so this has been a mutual pleasure though mm-hmm. really uh, so be in touch and and let me know if there are any questions but I and certainly I'm interested in the finished product but um, if there are any questions in the meantime but I'm sure you will be oh well, and we'll put it in there I'm so. You'll, you'll figure it out. So do what you think is necessary, but sure. I have a feeling it's fine, but that's the only area where I went. But anyway, all right, cool. Well, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. I will totally be keeping in touch now that you are someone I, I know instead of just one of my childhood heroes. Sure. <laughs> and, and now you will follow the dragon boat world with a different eye. It's true. I didn't, I didn't follow it with any eye before. I'd no, to you. no. I didn't know no. about it. I would say that there are very few... Dragon Boat conventions with thousands of people going to them. No, it's pretty pretty limited. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> you take care, Teddy. Absolutely. You, you have a wonderful day. Okay, folks, don't forget to like and subscribe. We've got more Tempo Talks recorded and coming your way. In the meantime, remember that we are all actors improvising. So play your role, big or small, with sincerity and heart, because your performance can inspire someone you've never even met. This has been your host, Tempo. If you're curious about the books I write, you can find a link in the description to Fur Planet Productions, who also sponsored this episode. Till next time, take care.